Welcome everybody to the online seminar series Machine Learning Needs uh, Mathematical Optimization. This is an activity from the Horizon 2020 uh, Marie Curie um, Rice uh, Needs Project um, in which we uh, brand the role of um, operations research in artificial intelligence with the support of uh, Europe. So today we are um, extremely pleased of uh, having uh, two speakers. So we have uh, Professor Ch Janssen, who is the Vice President of the European Research Council, telling us about uh, this uh, funding opportunity. And then we will have uh, um, uh, Birge Atasoy, who will be speaking about uh, uh, the transportation operations research in uh, machine learning. So for the audience, uh, Professor Janssen will be uh, speaking for um, about 10 minutes. And please, if you have any questions, uh, put them in the chat and uh, we will be happy to uh, read those questions for him. Um, and he will be happy to answer them uh, uh, at the end of his presentation. Thank you so much, Professor Janssen, for being here. Uh, we know that uh, you are very busy, but it's very meaningful for us, um, um, your speech today. The floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for your interest in the European Research Council, the ERC. And uh, by background, I'm a climate scientist. So I, I work on reconstructing climate change but I'm now the vice president for uh, physical and, and um, engineering science uh, domain in the ERC. So, so there, are, there are three vice presidents and I, I cover the most relevant field maybe to, to your uh, interests. So just a few words about the ERC. It's a part of Horizon Europe as your project also is. Um, it has a, a, a budget of 16 billion euros over uh, the seven years of its duration. And, and we, we spend about 17% of the entire Horizon Europe budget. So each year we have a budget of about 2.2 uh, billion euros and, and we hand out about 1,000 grants per year in all areas of research. So the ERC is governed by an independent scientific council with 22 members, I'm, I'm one of them. Uh, this also includes the ERC president, Maria Leptin. And we have full authority over the strategy of the uh, ERC. And we are supported by uh, an implementation structure, the ERC executive agency which basically handles all the, all the proposals and all the funding uh, that we hand out. Now, the principle of the ERC is that scientific excellence is the sole criterion. So we are looking for the most um, daunting ideas that you may have, regardless of where it sits in, 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 in research. Uh, so we support the individual scientists we do not support consortia, although we have uh, synergy grants where up to four, four scientists can collaborate. There are no predetermined subjects. It's entirely bottom up. So it's the ideas that you may have that we fund if, if they are considered uh, uh, good enough and, and interesting enough. So we support frontier uh, research in all fields of science and humanities. And our projects are peer-reviewed uh, internationally. Uh, so excellence is the sole evaluation criteria. Uh, primarily, we will now analyze the excellence of the research project, its groundbreaking nature, the scientific impact, the scientific approach, its feasibility. Uh, so the evaluation is primarily focused on the proposed project. Then we focus also on the extent to which the principal investigator has the required scientific expertise and capacity to execute the project. That, that will now come after the, 
evaluation of the research project earlier, we sort of uh, did this um, together, but but we have changed to, to get more focus on, on the science. So it's the intellectual capacity, the creativity and commitment of, of those who, who propose uh, projects to us. In terms of um, uh, uh, artificial intelligence and the ERC, uh, the ERC has supported the development of, of, uh, of the field uh, since its beginning about 15 years ago. And we see that recent advances, uh, particularly in, in generative AI, will bring profound changes both to society at large and, of course, to the research process. And uh, we are open to, to the use of AI uh, for, for developing ideas and projects, of course, also to develop the field itself. Uh, but we acknowledge that the use of external help of this kind in preparing a proposal does not relieve the author from taking full and sole leadership responsibilities with regard to acknowledgements, plagiarism, and other pr good practices, uh, practices of good scientific uh, and professional conduct. Now a bit about machine learning in ERC projects. Uh, the development of this sits primarily in, in the panel of PE6 computer science and informatics. But as I will show you, uh, uh, it's used all over uh, the ERC. So for this presentation, uh, I will not make a, a large differentiation between artificial intelligence and machine learning. So that's primarily dis, uh, disregarded here. Uh, ESC's AI projects portfolio is not necessarily similar to the whole research area in Europe either. So, so we fund what we get basically by, by Europe's uh, researchers. A rough estimate of AI projects within this uh, panel, computer science and informatics, uh, is that about 46% of all the projects deal in some way with AI. And also a big part of the ERC's AI projects are not primarily in this panel. Uh, so, so that's more the application of, of AI and machine learning to, to various fields, which has seen a, a fantastic spread over the, over the last few years. If you look at the the um, projects, you can see uh, and the keywords used in the in this project, you can see that uh, by far the most uh, important keyword in terms of AI is machine learning. It's it's at the bottom here, uh, which covers uh, about fifty percent of all proposals mention of all projects mention uh, machine learning in in some way. And this has, has gone up uh, tremendously uh, over the last few years. So if you look at the AI projects if, uh, from, from all over the ERC, uh, of course, there's lots in computer science and engineering, but there's also many in social sciences and humanities, medicine, physics, biology, environmental sciences, mathematics, space science, and psychology. And, and those marked with a star here are emerging fields, uh, which are, have been increasing in importance, uh, showing that the spread of, of using AI and machine learning is now uh, covering uh, almost all aspects of, of what we fund. Uh, just a second. Within computer science, uh, there's a large uh, amount of projects in human-computer interaction and interfaces. But as you will see here, also many other aspects of scientific computing is, is, uh, is covered in our AI projects. And uh, if you look to the right here, the uh, application areas within other engineering areas uh, is also quite high, uh, particularly in robust robotics and in in simulation uh, and uh, signal processing. 
Uh, here we go to 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 other areas of research. And if you look at the left column here, there's quite a substantial number of projects in linguistics and computational linguistics uh, that have AI and, and uh, uh, machine learning in them. And that's, of course, uh, something that is increasing uh, uh, in response to the, to the large growth in, in, in large language models. Uh, but you can see also in other fields of social sciences and humanities, there is a quite large impact of, of artificial intelligence in our projects. Uh, and it's the same in environmental sciences, the column to the right. Uh, uh, for instance, in metrology, atmospheric physics, climatology, climate change, modeling of, of uh, uh, climate change using using big data sets uh, to infer patterns. Uh, uh, there's been a large spread of of, uh, of artif artificial intelligence methods in this area, and I would think that most of the projects in in, uh, for instance, in climate modeling, climate prediction, uh, is now using these types of, of methods. Uh, we are aware that in, in the machine learning domain, uh, the publications in certain conferences is as important as in many journals. So, so if you submit a proposal to us, we are aware that uh, lots of the, the scientific dialogue exists uh, in conferences, which is a bit uh, unlike in, in other areas. But we are, we are aware of this and, and uh, uh, this is something we're used to. And that research in the methodologies is at least as relevant as developing data sources. We also note that researchers on AI report on challenges in attracting talent. And in that sense, the ERC is perceived as an award that facilitates attracting talent. So, so that is uh, a place to go for, for talented people if they want to have a project, develop their skills, develop their own ideas, and be recognized by their peers and, and potential um, employers. And there's also a difficulty to retain talent, uh, we've noted, that the industry offers competitive salaries, which uh, academia uh, in most of the areas don't uh, to the same extent. And that also there are maybe complications in terms of, of fundamental research and regulation. And we are somewhat afraid that too much regulation in this area may stifle uh, uh, frontier research so that uh, we are very, it's very important for us that uh, regulations which may come and, and for good reasons uh, is not penalized. And then we would encourage promoting new opportunities for cooperation and mobility with uh, important countries such as USA and China and other places on AI research. This could be small missions and smaller projects focused on individual experts, uh, as is what we fund. And this is uh, basically what I had to say. Uh, I thank you for your attention and uh, look forward to uh, receiving feedback and answering questions. Thank you very much, Professor Jansen. It's very um, uh, detailed presentation that you gave um, about uh, artificial intelligence and um, this uh, great funding opportunity. Are there any questions from the audience um, uh, for Professor Jansen? Uh, so please raise your hand and we will give you the rights uh, to talk and to show the camera. I think uh, some questions may come uh, um, at the end uh, in the joint Q&A session. Um, so uh, we will um, uh, move on with the presentation of uh, uh, Milge Atasoy. 
uh, and um, if you are able to stay that would be great uh, otherwise we will understand that you uh, are, are very busy um, but thank you again for Thank you, and I, I think I would have to leave for, for yes. a meeting with the schedule in, a, in not too, too long. Thank you so much uh, for, for the very detailed presentation again, and for making time for our uh, online seminar series. Thank you, and good luck. Thank you very much. So we are uh, going to move on, and uh, we have uh, the pleasure of having uh, uh, Birgit Tassoy, who is an, an associate professor from the um, Delft. Uh, so prior to that, uh, Birgit um, obtained the master degree and the bachelor's degrees in industrial engineering from uh, Bogasici University. And she did her uh, PhD studies in uh, EPFL in Switzerland. And then she moved to um, uh, the MIT as a research scientist and from there to TU Delft. So she works on adaptive uh, transportation and logistics uh, and combining methodologies from operations research, real-time optimization, dynamic and predictive optimization, random utility models, choice models, machine learning and Bayesian uh, techniques. She has uh, published in leading journals in those fields, such as uh, Decision Support System, Transportation Research Part C and Part E, and Transportation Science. And she has received funding from different agencies, such as the Research Council in the Netherlands, the MBO, and uh, also from the ERC. Um, and she has received a starting grant uh, from them. So we are very pleased uh, to have you today, uh, uh, Bilge, with us. Uh, the floor is yours. And for the audience, uh, remember that we will um, um, take urgent questions on the chat. And if not, we will have a Q&A session at the end. Yeah, thank you, Dolores. So I'm happy to be here. Indeed, as Dolores mentioned, I was, uh, I'm happy that I received recently an ERC starting grant. And actually, I was one of those who mentioned machine learning, and uh, but not in the computer science uh, panel. So it was in the social science because I combined both uh, operation research and transportation related uh, aspects under social sciences. So that is the way I found my place, let's say, in that panel structure. And I'm also, if you have uh, questions on that later, if you are working on relevant domains, you know, you can drop me an email if you are interested. So I will go ahead. So I will first, what I will do, I will first start with what I mean by adaptive transportation systems. And I want to give two examples of, you know, a bit more specific work uh, to make it concrete. So as uh, Dolores already mentioned, I my work in, it lies at the intersection of operation research, machine learning and behavioral modeling. And what I mean by that is basically I'm interested in adaptive decision making. And for that, of course, I lie, I'm interested in incorporating machine learning, not, di not like a black box of data driven techniques as such, but really in combination. So having model based uh, domain knowledge uh, within learning. So and in addition to that, I'm also investigating uh, how decision makers behave where we include also the heterogeneity in this decision making and that I also in different works I also see that as part of our optimization models to incorporate how the users uh, behave uh, so today I will not be able to talk on that side much because I picked two examples um, to make sure, but still I wanted to mention it in any case. So, and my application domain is transportation systems. And there I like to see myself as working towards using the right resources at the right place and at the right time. And this actually addresses quite some challenges that we are facing with like sustainability and efficiency. And I'm a believer that it's not only about emissions, it's also about how we work with our resources. So towards that aim. 
Um, so here is just a brief, you know, way of telling why, what I mean by adaptive transport systems. So here you can think of a delivery system, for example, where we keep receiving information from the network itself. So you can think of it as there are sensors or in certain information where we collect about delays, for example. And my uh, idea was how can we make use of this in updating different levels of decisions in the transport network. So uh, here, for example, depending on how you observe the delays, you could think of, okay, in different parts of the network at different times of the day, maybe I should change the way I allocate my fleet. And this could in the long run actually say, maybe I need to even think about things about my network design. So maybe I need to have a new distribution center or maybe use different modes of transportation. And these all happen at different time scales. So these type of decisions are at different time scales. And instead of creating this huge uh, optimization model that will tackle all those decisions, what if we go in a learning manner? So can we really adapt those decisions using the information from the system, from the environment, and from the users. And the users here play a role as well, because if you remember that delivery system we talked about, so this population might be um, switching to different technologies. They might be you know, having different preferences towards different times of the day. And depending on their location, it might change, and so on. So if you are going to invest in certain resources in the network, this can be done better if we incorporate that also trends on the user side. So that is overall, you know, what my idea was about adaptive transport systems. And now I want to give you two examples of my work that, you know, paves the way for those developments. One would be a bit more generic framework. So, but still you can think of the example of delivery systems. Uh, and then I will give a case study about that. Uh, but there we don't work with complex multimodal network in terms of changing modes and so on. But still, I wanted to give that example. So in the second example, it will be more in this long haul multimodal transport network. So the first work is actually uh, the work of my PhD, Pedro, which we are supervising together with Payman. Uh, and then Pete was partly involved during his master studies, so I wanted to acknowledge them here. And the idea is actually, if we think of the um, system as like we, re we see the, the environment and we see the decisions by the expert. So we know the expert is making these decisions according to some model that we don't know exactly. And the learner is basically here trying to imitate those decisions and trying to understand better and better the exact, uh, basically the model in the mind of the expert. And there basically the assumption is the expert is optimizing a certain model and then uh, the, um, uh, using the inputs in the system and giving this decision basically the response based on that and this unknown cost uh, to us is you know basically we don't know exactly what type of a cost function and uh, the expert is optimizing and here you can think of it as different applications here for example when i'm making choices in a network like a route choice decision um, i consider a utility but when I'm optimizing here, I don't know what exact utility you are thinking of. Or if you are optimizing the routes, which I will give the examples of, you don't know the route costs, but you rather see what routes are taken. And then the idea is basically has similar notion of supervised learning. I see some, you know, I have some inputs in the system. I see the decisions, the output, the responses, but this is a black box to me. And what I'm doing is basically I'm considering an hypothesis function uh, to uh, transform this input and the difference between what I have out of my, as a result of my hypothesis function and the dif difference of that to the expert decision is my loss function, which I'm trying to minimize. And here, as I said before, so the F uh, function is an unknown cost of the expert and I am trying to get closer to the decisions by fitting certain parameters like theta in my model, in the, in the learner's model. 
And there, basically, we have those uh, training data set where we have those inputs and the responses to those inputs. We have a certain hypothesis space with that hypothesis function, and we are minimizing the loss. And as typical in these settings, we can also have a regular regularization term to avoid overfitting. So what I will do is now I will walk you through this on a routing example. So here you can think of a graph, a transport network with certain nodes. And then actually what we don't observe from the expert is this theta, the route costs, uh, but we observe the route instead, the chosen route by the expert. And uh, again, as I already introduced before, I have certain inputs from the transport system. It could be demand, set of customers, time windows, uh, you name it. Then um, I see the decisions of the expert. I see what routes the expert took and I'm trying to match that. And uh, for that, basically here, I can say that the uh, costs, the weights for the edges that are considered by the expert are not known to me. Uh, and I am trying to fit those thetas through the procedure. And how I, and at the end, I want to be with my result, I want to be as close as possible in terms of the route to the expert route. And for this, uh, actually, you can think of it as like gradient descent uh, algorithm, where we start with certain theta, certain parameters, and we update it uh, with the hope of getting closer in terms of the output of the routing. So I will walk you through the example here with a capacitated vehicle routing problem. Since we have the input and the decisions, the route decisions available in the training set, so we have the taken expert route uh, is available to us. So here you see it on the top right corner. And I start with uniform cost, uniform cost, let's say. All the thetas are the same. And then um, when I start with that, I solve a capacitated vehicle routing problem. I get the optimal route given these weights. Uh, but when I start, typically I'm far away from the expert route. So this is the difference to that expert route. So the red means I uh, included something which is not in the expert route, and green is the ones that uh, I needed to have, let's say. So, and with this difference, thinking about that gradient descent algorithm, I update the weights. Now, the, the ones that become thicker are the ones that are the good ones, so basic that are similar to the, uh, they have lower cost and similar to the expert route. And eventually, I basically solve again the routing, I get another difference. In the simple example, let's say in the second iteration, in the second epoch, we came to a point where we end up with the same route. It doesn't mean I replicate exactly the thetas of the expert, but I reach the same route. So uh, that, is an, that was an example with capacitated vehicle routing problem. But now I will show you a case study with um, Amazon challenge. So actually, it's a, it's a pity that we couldn't join the challenge ourselves, but uh, we saw it later. But then we saw that the ideas were quite similar. So the idea of Amazon was that they have a certain um, they have those routes by the drivers, experts, and they realize that actually when they optimize it with certain objective functions, they were not always capturing well those good decisions by the drivers. So typically those drivers are considering a lot of other real life considerations, right? So maybe they they know it's difficult to park somewhere. They know when they go there at that time of the day, there is some weird thing going on. So they incorporate those real life considerations. And the idea was, can we learn from those drivers. So that fit quite well to what we were trying to do. Then we wanted to test it here. So unfortunately, we cannot get those prices, but still, it was fun to work with. So the one thing that uh, is remarkable here is the data is very sparse in the sense that there are many stops that are visited only a few times in the whole historical data. So that's why actually it was wise to go from stops to zones. So instead of going through every individual stop to make the route, so we first looked at the zones and then went back to the stops. So I will also talk about that later. So here the idea is again um, similar to what I already showed. We treated this as a TSP problem because the data itself is given for a certain driver and a driver starts from a depot and comes back to the depot. Uh, so they 
visit only a subset of the nodes in the network because there are many of those drivers serving different neighborhoods. So that's why for a given driver, actually it's a TSP problem and that is how we handled it. And then we had the first approach with the generic inverse optimization idea I showed already. And then we had a second approach where we incorporated some penalizations, which mean because we have those zones and also we had areas, regions, there were different labeling in the uh, network and those we incorporated uh, in such a way that if you move between different regions, you would get a penalty. If you move between different areas, you would get another penalty. So the, we tried to represent a bit the structure in the network because this was what we observed in real data. So the, the drivers tend to stay in the same uh, geographical region let it be the zone or the area, however it is defined. So we tested these two uh, different versions, but before I show some results, I want to give the complete approach here. So essentially what we did, we had those, um, uh, we had the training data, we moved from stops to zones. We basically um, applied our inverse optimization idea at the level of the zone, and then we get the uh, uh, parameters, the theta parameters. And in the test data, so I forgot to mention, but there was also test data that was published to uh, you know, compare different techniques. And there also the same thing we did on the test data. We came up with the zone idea. Then basically given our uh, parameters that we obtained with inverse optimization, we solved the TSP for each of those routes. And then now we have the solution of the TSP, but it is at the zone level. Then we need to go back to the stops level because that is actually the actual route we need to have. And uh, that was done so other set of TSP problems. And uh, then when we got the uh, um, routes at the stop level, then we were able to go and compute the score. And this score was also published by Amazon uh, to be able to compare the different approaches. And here, these were the 20, public, 20 contestants joined this challenge. And there was one, another one that was published after the uh, challenge as we are, uh, but we were really happy to see that we could get good results in terms of the scoring. But of course, this doesn't tell much about the uh, um, model itself. So here are also a few other, um, because this score is a black box in a sense. So, uh, but we wanted to also see some uh, computational results here. So the first approach, if you remember, didn't include those information from the network and the second one included. And here you can see the advantage of including this zone region level type of ideas. And also you see the both the scores at the test and uh, training scores. And uh, on top of this, we also did some other investigations, like uh, what if we didn't use the whole uh, data set that was available, because you can see the training time uh, is, is not trivial. So we could see that with 40, 60 percent already uh, of the available data set, you, we could get, get similar scores uh, to the 100 percent um, usage of the data and you see the development of the training time there. Uh, one thing I need to say is remember in our framework for each data that we end up at each iteration of the algorithm, we um, solve the TSP. So in this Amazon challenge, it's a TSP. So there it is flexible to use any type of solver. So in the Groby settings here, we solved it until optimality. So actually, if you would expect, so if, if you would accept some optimality gap, so you can reduce this training time. Uh, and then in OR tools, there were some most approximative methods. So you see that the training time can be better and reaching the same similar Amazon scores. So uh, that was uh, what we did with the Amazon Challenge. And actually now we are looking into dynamic recovering problems. So where uh, the requests come dynamically. So and there we need to change a bit the way we kind of represent the problem, like the hypothesis function, if you will. So there uh, we are thinking of having it like a price collecting dynamic recovering problem. So as you decide dispatching or postponing and depending on how good that decision was, you could uh, collect prices. So that is an interesting direction to move forward. And that will also mean I can move towards an adaptive nature um, a bit more closely. So that's why I'm excited about that extension here. 
For this work, we have a theoretical paper on the inverse optimization side and also the routing modeling side. So uh, you can find them if you type uh, our names. And also we have an open source Python code for the inverse optimization technique. So um, that was for the first part. So if I can go on, till, so let's see how much I go in 10 minutes. So is it fine if I go until part of us? Or don't, don't, don't worry. Uh, yeah, don't worry. So, Maybe just, until 20 past or so. I don't answer. worry. Uh, yes, yes, please take your time to present. It. <laughs> so the first part, as I said, so this inverse optimization idea was uh, on routing models. It's a bit of a generic work, but still the type of examples we work with were delivery problems with one type of mode that we worked. So that's why I wanted to also give this example on um, uh, you know, multimodal transport network. So here the idea is, the, it was the PhD of Yimang and uh, uh, there the idea was using reinforcement learning in a model assisted fashion. And the problem is actually here we consider a multimodal transport network where we need to have a transshipment between different modes. So it, you can consider this as container transportation, for example, from the ports to the hinterland. Then uh, here the transshipments are actually creating quite some uncertainty in the overall problem because you need to synchronize those modes. And uh, those modes have their own characteristics. Some are flexible, some are fixed uh, in terms of routes or schedule. And then actually you have the terminals in between and also various things can happen at the terminal. So it becomes a large scale problem to think of uh, also. Um, and there we, what we focused on was service time uncertainty at the terminals. It is not the only level, on, only source of uncertainty, but it was just one uh, thing we tackled. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to see if with reinforcement learning, we can learn from experience and adjust the routes and schedules, um, you know, under this service time uncertainty. But we didn't want to do it in a, so we didn't want to use RL as is uh, for the whole decision making, but it was more towards that uncertainty part. So, and what I mean by that is actually, we previously worked on this uh, intermodal transport network with uh, adaptive large neighborhood search, where you have typical operators uh, for transport problems like removing um, certain uh, requests from certain arcs and assigning them to another one. So you have those well-developed optimization algorithms for transportation problems. So we didn't want to change the whole setting, but what we said, okay, we can have the planning, the initial planning by such a, an established um, algorithm. And then uh, if we were to incorporate stochasticity in a more, you know, standard way, like traditional way, you would come up with a stochastic optimization model, but then we would need to define things like, for example, either you define distributions for those uncertainties or you come up with uncertainty sets and they may work very well under, you know, if you have good uh, definition of them, but then we wanted to try something different. So can we do it with the learning, reinforcement learning type of an idea? So without assuming any distribution or any uncertainty set. So there basically this uh, LNS was uh, doing uh, different things. So basically providing the state of the state to reinforcement learning and also the rewards to the reinforcement learning agent. And there we did it with three different types of strategies. So one was like uh, the two of them as benchmarks. One was a waiting strategy representing traditional transport planning. Basically when something goes wrong, they delay the activity, but not very quickly change the mode, for example. So we wanted to represent that. And the other one was uh, learning the average duration of the event. So if there is a delay in the service times and they were, it, the strategy was trying to learn that average duration and adding that average duration on top of the actual, uh, the original planning. And if it was infeasible, then look, would look for different modes. And if it was still feasible, it would keep whatever that was planned. And the RL strategy would learn what to do. And I will talk about those actions in a second. But so basically first it was trained until it was mature enough. And of course you can say, when is it mature? So we defined it uh, for a number of, um, 
tests if it was above 0 0.9 reward uh, so then we would keep it mature and it would start implementing those actions but until then it would be in the learning phase so and how basically a bit more detail about the RL methodology so here just to remind so RL is learning how to replan uh, rather than assuming distributions on unexpected events and it is not creating the full plan so there the state is the current time the past terminals until this point the travel time between terminals and the delayed tolerance of that particular request depending on their desired arrival time uh, desired delivery time and then the action of rl could be uh, if there is an unexpected event happening it will be triggered and then it would either remove that uh, request from that original plan and look for another option for example in another mode in another route uh, or not so and if the action is right it would get a reward of one and zero otherwise and right means if you removed and if there was really delay it was the right action and if you removed but then actually it could have been done on the original plan it was not a reward so and this is just an example so initially you consider to do it by barge and then uh, there is a uh, there is some unexpected event in this terminal and you decided to edit a train a route so for a case study we used uh, this uh, european gateway services network on the rhine alpine corridor from the port of rotterdam to inland europe uh, germany in this case so we have three terminals in the port area and seven inland terminals we have 100 something services spanning barges trains and trucks and we tested with different uh, number of requests and there um, of course to think about those unexpected events we didn't have real data that's why we need to define some scenarios that made sense so but those distributions were not available to rl this was purely for simulating and uh, evaluating the performance of the methodology so there we had different cases like small disturbances uh, severe ones disruptions and some with higher variability some tight distribution so we tested with different things and one thing that i want to um, highlight is in one in the first type of set of results we said one terminal is typically creating one type of an event so uh, basically from that terminal you will not get two events that are really different in terms of the duration so they are here all in hours so you will not get uh, one with 10 hours of a dis uh, like you know delay and 80 hours of a delay from the same terminal this was the first step then we allowed it in the next scenario so then it's given terminal also can create different types of events you can think that the first version where terminal creates similar type of events then actually learning algorithm easily labels that terminal so with that severity of the event and that uh, you know works better but then when you have multiple type of events from the same terminal it's getting a more complex learning task and here are just some examples so in this one we have some uh, severe disturbances with variations and here uh, large disruptions uh, with not much variability so here you see that the delay um, with the with respect to the benchmarks of the reinforcement learning here you see that most of the time delay is reduced with reinforcement learning and also in both of the scenarios uh, one thing i need to say is the number of requests increases so 100 it's for lns the algorithm that creates those plans and that becomes a complex problem so you may that may not guide rl as with the optimal solutions but rather suboptimal solutions that also is part of the hindrance here in the performance but overall we saw the potential of rl then we moved to these multiple events at a given terminal so from the same terminal you could create different types of events and what we assumed here was that the terminal operator would be able to provide some indication of that for example uh, the terminal operator would give let's say color coding i don't know in reality so that it would indicate um, it will not tell the duration of course so the terminal operator will not provide the duration of that event but will indicate it is level one um, event or level six so we created those uh, things so and then uh, when we gave that label uh, so here you see the version 
without the label and with the label. So then um, you see the improvement. So we have a bit more potential uh, when we have those information to the RL. And here, uh, a bit more details. So here, the average reward you can see, again, with respect to those benchmarks uh, and the delay. So here we see that the delay can also be reduced quite significantly. When we were doing that, we, of course, acknowledge that this information may be imperfect in real life. So you may not, so even though the terminal operator says it is level one, maybe it goes on and on and you at the end have a very large disruption. So we also wanted to uh, see the impact of this. So we said, what if uh, at the top figure here, what if 20% of the case you received a certain level information, but it was randomly drawn from any of the six levels. And in the bottom figure, it was 50% of the case that the actual level was randomly drawn. So, and even in those cases, uh, with some increased training iterations, so you see that the reward was still between 0.7 and 0.8. And um, here you also see some uh, transport related performance indicators like what would be the average cost savings, what would be average rating per reduction. You see also the potential across different uh, scenarios. But the training time can vary a lot uh, between those things like from one to two hours or to uh, 48 hours. Uh, one final thing I want to say on this is actually something that the reviewers wanted us to do, so was to also apply the train policy to complete another network. And this we tried with some scenarios, not with all uh, mixed event type of scenarios, but we tested it on another um, uh, network, where you see those orange ones are actually the new ones. Uh, the blue ones are the previous network we had together with the green because the green were shared between the two companies. So basically those green and blue ones were the ones that we trained the policy on and then the orange ones were the new ones and we tested a few scenarios um, where we have disturbances and bigger disruptions. So here you see some indication how the reward evolves for those different scenarios. And we could see that it, we could still uh, get a reward above uh, 0 0.7 for those. This was an example for the transferability of the results. And for this, for the ALNS, the algorithm on coming up with the original planning, we have this paper here and also the one with reinforcement learning, you can also see by, I don't know, a chance they are both in part C, but yeah, <laughs> it's available to you. So before the last couple of minutes, I want to say a few things about this, what um, we can take away from this type of work. Actually, for me, it was clear that domain knowledge is very important. Like, let, let it be the inverse optimization one for the delivery type of problems. Uh, basically there, when we incorporated this information from the network, those different regions, zones, it became significantly better. And also for the reinforcement learning case, if you are dealing with different types of uncertainties, so if you incre include some labeling there, even without giving the actual distribution, it was helping. So, and also there, LNS was, um, providing the feedback to the reinforcement learning. There is, so to me, when you don't treat those learning algorithms as complete black box, actually there is all, quite some potential even for transport network problems. Why I say this, because transportation network problems are, um, they have a lot of interdependency. So if you do some, if you make a decision in part of the network, you it can propagate to other parts of the network or the different times of the day. So you create a lot of interdependency between your resources across time and space, actually. So that's why it is those are challenging problems. And the training time, therefore, is not trivial. So those are uh, some things we uh, observed. And then further ideas on this is actually, I believe, if there is a right um, combination of offline and online algorithms, it can be quite interesting because offline you can keep learning uh, from the network, from your system, and online you could also 
implement some of them already, depending on the type of problem. So I think this offline online uh, nature can be investigated further. And also uh, the model based nature that uh, I'm striving for, it can also incorporate behavioral notions, as I mentioned in the very beginning. So that will be also some other track I will investigate in the future. And I think I want to stop now for answering questions, if any. Thank you so much uh, for such an uh, impressive presentation with so much detail and also for the takeaways, which is important for, uh, say, uh, um, uh, people who want to work in these problems. So um, if you if the audience has questions for Bilge, uh, please raise your hand and we will give you the rights to the camera and to the microphone. don't think um, there are uh, at the moment any questions, uh, Birger, so probably... I hope it was not that boring, huh? <laughs> so, yeah. no, 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 no. I, uh, I have a, a weak uh, point for um, uh, the topic that you have presented with the black boxes uh, <laughs> uh, and non blank boxes. So I, I did enjoy very much. And, and you, you can see that there are uh, people also... Uh, yeah, uh, that they enjoyed the talk. So it was uh, all very, um, very clear. You see, <laughs> thank you so much for the audience. Uh, um, so we are going to finish here. Thanking again, uh, Bilge for uh, her and uh, Bilge for uh, her time to come in such a busy um, uh, month, which is always December. Um, <laughs> I would also like to thank the audience again for the same reason, because, um, you know, um, it's always difficult uh, to organize things in the month of uh, December. So thank you very much for coming uh, to uh, build this presentation and, and to the introduction that we have on the ESC. And um, I would like to close this season, but I would also like to announce that we will be uh, uh, back uh, in 2024 after uh, all the season's uh, celebrations. Um, and I have just put there uh, a few names that are confirmed uh, to be speaking in our uh, Spring season, we, we like to use season numbers, so it will be season seven. Uh, and we will be back in February as usual, and we will run for a few months. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, senior colleagues that you, um, um, I'm pretty sure you uh, know some of these names. Um, 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 thank them for agreeing. But also we will have uh, uh, nine young speakers coming from different countries around the world. Uh, so we hope to see you back in 2024. And uh, to follow, uh, say, uh, when we will be back uh, is the usual thing, LinkedIn, uh, X or Twitter, and uh, our mailing list. So I have to thank everybody, in particular today, Bill and uh, uh, Einstein for their presentations, and uh, see you soon. Yeah, thanks for inviting. So. <laughs> thank you for coming. Uh, it was a, a very, very, very nice presentation combining, um, yes, uh, machine learning, operations research, and many other things that you do. So good luck with it. Thanks.